So it's a pleasure to have Lydia speaking today. Lydia was uh, my intern one, one or two years ago, uh, so I know her very well. Uh, this is some joint work with a lot of other people that I know very well. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. It's really nice to um, talk to this group. Um, yeah, uh, feel free to, uh, I guess, unmute if you want to ask a question. I think I can only see my slides. So, um, yeah. uh, right, so today I want to talk to you about uh, this new paper that we have, which is joint work with uh, Gavin Brown, Marco Gabardi, and Adam Smith from BU, the Boston University, um, and my advisor, John Allman from Northeastern. Um, so this paper is called Covariance Aware Private Mean Estimation Without Private, Private Covariance Estimation. Um, but really, um, maybe a less uh, fancy title is Differentially Private Gaussian Mean Estimation. Um, and so this is the problem we're studying. Um, and so we'll start with the setup. In this setting, our input is n IID samples that, that are drawn uh, from a d-dimensional Gaussian distribution, uh, which has an unknown mean mu and unknown covariance matrix sigma. Um, so uh, again, this is the input that we have. And what we want to do is to find uh, a mean estimator, mu hat, that is epsilon delta differentially private and has Mahalanobis distance from the true mean mu at most alpha. Uh, I'll tell you what both of the things are um, in a bit. Uh, but I wanted to uh, set the to um, give you the setting and um, make everyone uh, feel familiar with the, the parameters of the problem. Um, so what we want is to have this estimator that has low sample complexity, and uh, the sample complexity, which is the number of samples n that uh, we draw from the uh, Gaussian distribution, um, has to have a small dependence on D, which is the dimension of the data, alpha, which is accuracy uh, or the Malanobis distance uh, from the true mean, epsilon and delta, which are the privacy parameters. Um, and in general, this is a fundamental problem, um, even uh, without privacy, and, uh, but also it's a building block for other problems that um, we are sophisticated, uh, like uh, optimization or uh, linear regression. OK, so this is our setup. Um, and in this work, in this paper, what we do is that we design two such estimators, two mean, mean estimators, which have small Mahalanobis distance from the mean, um, that are differentially private and have nearly optimal sample complexity under the assumption that the data are, let's say, Gaussian. Uh, also sub-Gaussian, but let's focus on Gaussian data for the talk. Um, and I'm giving you the theorem because um, I wanted to uh, show you a sample complexity that we're going for as uh, we go forward in the talk. So our result says that there is an epsilon delta differentially private estimator, but given d over alpha squared plus d over alpha epsilon samples, and let's forget about the last um, term with a log factor, um, from a Gaussian distribution returns uh, an estimator that um, is uh, has small uh, Mahalanobis distance from the mean. And again, alpha is the accuracy, epsilon and delta are the privacy parameters, and d is the dimension. So what we're going to do in this talk, first, I'm going to tell you what the problem, uh, what actually what Mahalanobis distance is. I'm going to tell you, uh, without privacy, uh, what Gaussian mean is, what we mean by Gaussian estimation and Mahalanobis distance. Then we'll uh, briefly define uh, privacy, differential privacy. Um, and then we'll go to prior work, which is actually going to be a significant chunk of the talk because hopefully it's going to help us understand how we got into the first mechanism that we uh, presented, uh, we proposed, the empirically rescaled Gaussian mechanism. Um, and uh, then I'm going to tell you about the second mechanism, 
and then we're going to sum up. So what does Gaussian mean estimation and what's this Mahalanobis distance that we uh, talk about? Because I'm going to be using this, uh, these pictures a lot, uh, let's take a moment to uh, think about them. Um, so we have NIAD data, which are d-dimensional points in the space. Um, mu is the unknown mean of the distribution, the Gaussian distribution. And sigma is represented by this ellipsoid, this ellipse uh, here. And what we mean by this picture is that with high probability, the data fall into that ellipsoid. The Gaussian data fall into that ellipsoid. Um, so what is the Mahalanobis distance that we want to measure our, our error in? Um, again, what we want to do is to find an estimator that has Mahalanobis distance from the mean at most alpha. So the Mahalanobis distance of mu hat from mu is defined just like the Euclidean distance, except it's transformed, it's distorted by the true covariance of the data. So, and this is uh, just opening up the distribution. No, sorry, opening up the expression. Um, so, again, it's the Euclidean distance of this vector if you transform it by the true covariance of the distribution. So to try to understand what this means, we'll start with a very simple case of the identity covariance. So if our data come from a uh, Gaussian which has identity covariance, then actually the Mahalanobis distance is exactly the same as the Euclidean distance. Uh, like this identity matrix here doesn't do anything. Now, if our data still come from a uh, Gaussian that has spherical covariance, but um, uh, the radius is, uh, say, one half. So if it comes from a, a data from a Gaussian that has covariance sigma squared times the identity where sigma is a half, then actually, what does it mean uh, to uh, satisfy this guarantee? What does it mean to have uh, an estimator that has Mahalanobis distance at most alpha from the mean? Actually, this estimator has to have Euclidean distance at most alpha over two from the mean. And so what this means is that the, um, the guarantee scales with the variance of the data. The guarantee that we ask for scales with the variance of the data. Um, even more interestingly, let's think about the case where the covariance matrix is not spherical. Um, what we really want in this case, intuitively, is that the error that we have in every direction scales with the variance of the data in every direction. And so in the directions of small variance, uh, we have to have much smaller error the distance, the mu hat minus mu um, ejected into that direction it has to have a much smaller error than the error that we are allowed in the directions of larger variance. By the way, can you see my mouse? Hi. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, great. So this is a pretty natural way to define the error because essentially the benchmark that, that we're uh, going for, because essentially the um, error that you're allowed in every direction scales with the uncertainty that you have already in your data uh, in this direction. Um, okay, so what do we do to solve, what can we do to solve the problem without privacy? Um, a natural thing to do is to take your data and average them and take this empirical mean of the data. Um, and the guarantee that this estimator has is uh, actually good. It says that if the number of samples that you draw is about at least D over alpha squared, where again, alpha is the target accuracy, then the Mahalanobis distance from the true mean is at most alpha. But what we want to do is to solve this problem with differential privacy. And this is my differential privacy slide. I'm going to go over 
the definition and a standard, uh, the standard Gaussian mechanism a bit faster, but uh, please stop me if you're um, unfamiliar or want to take uh, a closer look. Okay, so the financial privacy is a, um, formalizes the idea that if you change one thing in your input, if you change one data point in your input data set, then um, an adversary that sees the output of the algorithm um, and maybe has other information as well, shouldn't be able to tell just from the output of the algorithm, um, at least easily. Um, so more formally, we say that an algorithm is epsilon delta differentially private. If for any two data sets that differ in exactly one data point, the distribution over the output of the algorithm given input x um, and the distribution over the output given input y, where again, x and y are neighboring data sets, um, are close, actually epsilon delta close. And this sense of closeness um, is the following. It says that the probability that I see any outcome under the one distribution is bounded by e to the epsilon times the probability that I see the same outcome under the other distribution plus delta and vice versa. Um, there's this additive multiplicative uh, definition uh, that's also uh, symmetric. And usually we think of epsilon as a small constant and let's say 0 0.1 and delta as uh, much smaller than one over the number of users, uh, let's say one over uh, n squared. So one standard way to satisfy privacy, this uh, differential privacy, um, it actually revolves about around the central notion of uh, the global sensitivity of a function. So if with what you want to output is um, the f of x, function f on the data set x, um, then the global sensitivity of a function is uh, the maximum change that you could see in L2 norm um, if you change in the output of the function if you change one thing in the input, one data point in the input data set. And so one standard uh, way to achieve privacy is by using the Gaussian mechanism, which says that instead of outputting f of x, you're going to add to it Gaussian noise that scales with the global sensitivity of the function that you want to output over the privacy parameter epsilon, again, leaving the log factor aside. And the Gaussian mechanism is guaranteed to be epsilon delta differentially private, so your uh, output on f of x and your output on f of y is going to be epsilon delta close. And moreover, maybe something useful to have in mind is that um, the error that this mechanism introduces, the error that you have in L2 norm because you're not outputting f of x but you're outputting a noisy version of that, uh, scales with uh, the global sensitivity of the function times square root d over the privacy parameter epsilon. Okay, so this is a standard way to achieve privacy. So let's go back now to a problem, which again is to find uh, an estimator mu hat that has accuracy alpha and Mahalanobis distance, um, but is sort of epsilon delta differentially. Uh, and ideally, you want to uh, give an estimator that has a uh, sample complexity that's close to that of the non private one, the sample complexity d over alpha squared of the empirical mean. So let's start by seeing what the sensitivity of the empirical mean is. What if you wanted to use the Gaussian mechanism uh, on the empirical mean, which is the non private uh, estimator? Uh, the sensitivity of the empirical mean, the L2 sensitivity, uh, grows with 1 over n, which is the number of samples again times the uh, L2 distance that any two points could have, the two points that you're changing, the two points that you're swapping in the uh, differential privacy in your two neighboring data sets. So um, already to begin with, we have to deal with the fact that uh, for the Gaussian distribution, the data come from a d-dimensional, from R to the D, and so this could be arbitrarily large. So let's go to prior work and see um, what other approaches we have for this problem. 
Um, and actually, we'll start with easier versions of the problem um, to uh, try to build up to our solution. Any questions up to this point? Like what essentially the definition of the problem? Um, okay, so let's say we knew we know the covariance matrix. Let's assume that we uh, that sigma is known. In this case, actually, we can um, this case is equivalent to having an identity covariance. And the reason is that you can transform your data set. Um, uh, this, this just means that you can transform your data by uh, the, using the, the true covariance matrix so that um, after the transformation, it would be the same as the data drawn from a spherical Gaussian with identity covariance. And so the two cases are equivalent. And so let's think that we have data that come from the, uh, that have identity covariance. What we can do in this case is use an approach by Carmen Verdun, um, which actually is a one dimensional, works in one dimension, uh, but if we can use this approach in uh, all the D dimensions. Um, and what this algorithm will help us do is to find a rough estimation of where the mean lies, uh, not in the norm that we want, say in the uh, infinity norm. Um, so that we can actually be sure that Gaussian data are going to lie in um, a box of uh, side length, like each, each, in each dimension, the box is going to have a constant uh, length. Essentially, um, we know that the data are one standard deviation um, from their mean, and so we can truncate uh, in that box in every dimension. And so after we do this, since we know that this box has a uh, constant side length, and so each point from any other point in the box um, differ is uh, at most square root d far in L2 norm, then beyond this point, we know that the sensitivity of the uh, mean of the data is going to be square root d over n. Because again, square root d is the maximum distance between any two point, points in that box. And so since we've bounded the sensitivity, we can now use the, the standard Gaussian mechanism with a uh, uh, magnitude of the noise that's proportional to this uh, sensitivity, the uh, sensitivity of the mean, which is square root d over n. So now if, you, if we do that, we can actually get um, a really good sample complexity, which if you remember is the one that we're aiming to achieve, except we don't know the covariance in our case. So, yes? Okay. Yeah, sorry, I have a quick question. Why, yes. why, um, why are we bounding uh, clipping in every dimension? Why not clip the L2 norm here? Um, I think the analysis might be easier and probably better, right? Um, sorry. Back to from top, yeah. So, uh, what did you mean? Can you repeat that? So, what, yeah. why are we so, 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 step number two on this slide is you clip the data in every dimension using this algorithm by Carbon Vadon, right. which works in, yeah, right, right. In this work, um, we 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 clip the L infinity norm if you want, mm -hmm. and then derive an L2 sensitivity based on that L infinity clipping. But because we want a bond on the L2 sensitivity, why don't we do an L2 clipping, like clip in the L2 norm and derive a bound on the L2 sensitivity? Um, so I suppose we could uh, just project on a ball. It's uh, like good enough. But even if we did that, the ball would have to have this. Um... So you're using the histogram algorithm from Carl Vadon, right? Mm -hmm. So the the so you have a histogram for each dimension, right? Yes, and in every dimension, you have the uh, guarantee that you have is that the mean lies in essentially plus minus the standard deviation. 
Yeah, and I guess like uh, uh, going to Peter's point, my confession is very similar. Like, uh, given the problem setup, L infinity geometry should not come into the picture at least naturally. But just because of this clipping, this geometry is coming in, and it is unclear why it is coming in. I guess that's what Peter's question was also. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're getting a factor of root d here that you can avoid if you do L two clipping as opposed to L infinity clipping. Is my I think the guarantee that you have is different. It's like the you, you, this algorithm doesn't tell you um, such a good guarantee. Like where so, so I think the, the issue is the histogram algorithm that's being applied by Caravadan. It's not just clipping and then adding noise. Like they're, they're doing a histogram in each dimension. And if you wanted to do L2 clipping, you'd have to do like a histogram where each bin corresponds to like an L2 ball. Is it clear I, I, that you I, use this algorithm to decide where to clip? I is see. It clear? So does it uh, does it mean that instead of using a histogram, I mean, uh, uh, Karvan Vadan actually analyzed that for the histogram, but instead of using a histogram, you may actually put some kind of a net and operate over nets. Like you don't need a histogram per coordinate per se. So my confusion is not with the the bound what you are getting. My confusion is more with like this problem does not have L infinity geometry naturally yeah. baked in, and this L infinity yeah. geometry is coming from somewhere. And uh, if I understand correctly, it is coming from the Karva Vatan paper. And it is unclear that if that is, I mean, that algorithm gives the right bounds maybe, but it is unclear that is the right algorithm to use for the geometry. Right, it's just a naive approach. Hmm? Yes, no, I think I understand your point, but it's uh, probably a naive approach that gets us the, the sample complexity that we want in this um, setting, the non covariant setting. Um, Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, OK. Yes. Um, so, right. So, what I wanted to say at this point, the first thing was that, um, OK, right. Sorry. The first thing that I wanted to say. Uh, was that um, this is actually, uh, okay, this is the non-private term of the sample complexity, d over alpha squared, and the d over alpha epsilon is the overhead uh, in the sample complexity that we have due to the Gaussian mechanism. If we want to make this magnitude of the noise be smaller than alpha, essentially. Um, and what I wanted to say is that this is actually optimal by uh, Kalmuth, Lee, Singhal, and Allman. Um, if we know the covariance, then this is the best sample complexity we can get for an epsilon delta differentially private estimator. And again, this is what we're aiming for, except we don't know the covariance. OK, so the next setup we might think about is, OK, we don't know the covariance, but what if we know um, some bounds on the condition number of the covariance matrix? Um, what if we know that the covariance can be uh, is larger than the identity um, and smaller than a sphere that's uh, kappa times the identity? What if the covariance is spherical enough that it can be enclosed in these two balls so that kappa is not too large? So in this case, we would do actually the, exactly the same thing. Um, and uh, except now, in order to make sure that the data, Gaussian data, fall into uh, the clipping, actually don't get clipped, um, we have to have a larger box. Uh, and the sensitivity of the mean is going to grow square root d over d times kappa over n. And uh, so will the magnitude of the noise that we add in the Gaussian mechanism in the end. So the sample complexity of this approach would give us a d over alpha squared plus d times square root kappa over alpha epsilon. And so if kappa is small, if the covariance matrix is spherical enough so that we can bound it uh, in, uh, we can approximate it with a very small kappa, then um, this is actually a very good sample complexity. Now, let's move even further. Um, 
and assume that the prior information that we have is loose in the sense that now our covariance matrix is still between these two balls, but kappa has to be really large. Imagine that in one dimension, uh, the dimension of uh, smaller variance is, uh, sorry, the, the smaller variance uh, is much, much smaller than the larger variance of the covariance matrix. Um, and so for that case specifically, there's another algorithm uh, by Kamath, Lee, St. Helen, Elman that first does uh, the step that I'm, I'm not explaining. I'm not going to tell you how they do that. Um, they first do the step where from having this loose prior information about the covariance matrix, the find a new matrix M so that actually this matrix is really close to the true covariance. M is, uh, so the true covariance is bigger than M, but smaller than two times M. And so what we can do in that case is pretend that M is actually the covariance and again, transform the data like we did in the first approach, um, in the previous approach. But now uh, the kappa is really, really small, it's two. And so in that case, the sample complexity would grow as essentially what we would have in the previous approach with a constant kappa. But we also have the samples, uh, the, the number of samples uh, that we need in order to do step one, which is from this rough estimate of the covariance matrix, can you find um, uh, M, which is a covariance matrix that's really close to sigma. So this last term is D to the three, three halves over epsilon. And um, which means that the dependence that it has on uh, the dimension D is more than linear. It's super linear, it's 1.5. And in general, we think that our data are high dimensional. So the dependence on the, this parameter um, is something that we care about uh, perhaps even more. Um, but again, remember that actually what this algorithm does is something harder than what we want to do. This algorithm finds a private estimate of the covariance matrix. That's good enough for the second part to go through. Um, and so it needs the superlinear uh, number of samples, uh, superlinear in D number of samples in order to do that. So, so far, I hope it's becoming more and more clear that what we want to do um, is to add noise that is proportional to the covariance matrix. So if we insist on adding spherical noise, which is actually the noise that the Gaussian mechanism adds by default, um, then we would have to have to add enough noise that scales with the larger variance of the covariance matrix, with the variance of the direction of largest variance of the covariance matrix. Uh, it would be a spherical noise that could enclose the covariance matrix. But if we do that, there's no way we could guarantee uh, this small accuracy in Mahalanobis distance, because in uh, the directions of smaller variants, we would add a much bigger uh, noise. And in directions of smaller variant, Mahalanob variants, Mahalanobis distance only allows us to add smaller noise. Um, and so again, what we want to do is to add noise that's, that scales, that's a, that adapts with the covariance of the data. Um, but we want to do that without privately estimating the covariance of the data. And the reason is that, um, as, as we saw in the previous approach, um, that requires D to the three halves samples, and we don't want the dependence on D to grow. Um, actually, there are lower bounds uh, that say that in order to privately estimate the covariance, you need D to the three half samples, which are not for Gaussian data. Um, but perhaps this previous algorithm and this lower bound is evident enough that um, we should avoid privately estimating the covariance if we want uh, just to estimate the mean and Mahalanobis distance and to achieve the sample complexity. Okay. So with this intuition that what we really want to do is to um, add noise that scales with the covariance matrix, 
the true covariance. Um, we go to our first algorithm. So the main idea behind this first estimator is, OK, we don't know the covariance matrix, but we do know the empirical covariance matrix of the data, which actually for Gaussian data should be, um, if you draw these D samples, should be close enough to the covariance, the true covariance. So the main idea of the first estimator is instead of adding, uh, using the Gaussian mechanism as it is, what if we add uh, Gaussian noise that scales with the empirical covariance of the data? This hopefully so far, uh, it's intuitively, um, it's intuitive that it's accurate. Like uh, hopefully so far it's somewhat clear that if you do this, uh, then sigma x is going to be pretty close to sigma. And this means that the variance in every direction is going to scale with the variance, the true variance of the data, and you, we're going to satisfy the Mahalanobis distance guarantee. Now, the only question is, uh, assuming that we go with this approach, uh, is it private? And um, the answer is no, because remember, privacy has to hold uh, for any two neighboring data sets. Um, so, it could be the case that sigma x and sigma y, where x and y are two neighboring data sets, um, is very different. Um, so it could be the case that the noise that we're adding for two neighboring data sets is very different. And so an adversary could tell which data set uh, we had. So in order to get through this and make the algorithm private, we have to um, uh, observe one thing, which is that actually, if the data are Gaussian, then the two covariant matrices, the uh, empirical covariance uh, sigma x and the empirical covariance sigma y, should be pretty close if x and y are typical Gaussian data sets. Um, but to make sure that this happens, uh, we have to first do a pre processing step. And the pre processing step has to check exactly that thing, uh, that X and Y are typically uh, Gaussian. And so what this reprocessing step exactly does is the following. We say that um, a data set, X, remember again, is a data set. A data set X is good if its empirical covariance is invertible and if uh, for every point, the distance of that point from the empirical uh, mean of the data set with respect to the empirical covariance of the data set is at most square root D. Um, and this is actually not uh, uh, something that's unreasonable because uh, we know that if the data is Gaussian, then every point satisfies uh, this equality except um, with the true mean and true covariance of the data. So um, if, uh, sorry, covariance of the uh, distribution. So if the data of X is Gaussian, then it's going to be good with respect to the true mean and covariance of the distribution. Now we try to um, emulate that uh, condition by using the empirical mean and empirical covariance. Um, and again, what we uh, do is to say, check if by changing at most a few points, and a few is actually uh, 1 over epsilon, check if by changing at most a few points, 1 over epsilon points, your data set is good. So if this is true, we project our data set to the good set. We make sure we change these points, and we make sure that the data set is good. Um, now, if the data set is not close to being good, then we do nothing. Um, but again, if it is close to being good, we project to the good set and run the last, uh, the rescaled Gaussian mechanism. Um, and so for accuracy, again, we should be okay because Gaussian data sets are going to be good anyway, and we're not going to do any projection steps. Um, and we're going to, to run the last uh, 
step of algorithm, step three. Um, but to argue for privacy, we actually need to argue um, a couple of things. The first thing is that if the data sets are good and differ on a few points, then the empirical coincidences are close. And if they're close in that sense that I, I have not told you about yet, um, if they're close, then the distributions over the output of the algorithm um, with uh, input X and input Y are going to be epsilon delta close in the sense that we want them in the differential privacy sense. Um, so again, if you, yes. Okay, so I can ask a question after you're done with the lemmas. Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. So uh, this is what I want to say, that um, if you go through the first two checks, then the thing that goes, the data sets that go in the last step are guaranteed to be good. And maybe this projection step makes them go further apart, but they can't go too far because we know that they were pretty good to being, uh, pretty close to being good anyway. So uh, we might have changed one of our epsilon points in each data set. Um, so that's still close enough. They're close. Uh, they have one of our epsilon points that differ, not one, but there's still a few points. Um, and so data sets that go through the first two steps, neighboring data sets that go through the first two steps are guaranteed to be good and uh, about one of our epsilon close. Um, and I'm just flashing the closeness condition, but we don't have to go into that detail. Um, yes, please ask. ask yeah, one. so my question is like uh, the algorithm seems very much kind of tuned to Gaussian mechanism. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, my question is like, do you envision algorithms for similar guarantees? which is not so much like handcrafted to Gaussian mechanism. What I mean by that is like, uh, let's say that it, I mean, you are assuming the things are like full rank Gaussian, but they are coming from some low rank subspace. Yeah. This algorithm would break, right? Because you have yes, a we do. Mm -hmm. We do assume that sigma is full rank. Yeah. Um, our second algorithm actually, I guess, doesn't use uh, the Gaussian mechanism in that close a sense. Uh, it's, a, it's quite different. Um, so maybe there's hope in that direction. Um, but yeah, and I, I think there might be conditions that um, you could relax about this full rank uh, yeah. assumption, but yes, I think. The, so I guess the, the, my uh, general question was mostly that like if I, instead of using just specific to Gaussian mechanism, if I'm assuming some distribution which says third moment bound, based on moment bounds, can we expect uh -huh. similar results? Where you, you don't know exactly what the distribution is, but you just have moment bounds. I, I think, okay, yeah, this does work. Yeah, it works for things that are sub-Gaussian definitely, like things that concentrate at least as well as the Gaussian. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I'm not sure what would happen if you uh, have higher uh, moments. Yeah. If I can like chime in, I think like the rates yeah. have to be different, but I don't think that anything about the approach breaks. It's just that the data you have isn't guaranteed to be good for quite the same. No, but your but your test your test is relying on the uh, your your test is like this talking about invertibility, right? So the test uh, and I'm, the, the other part is fine, but for empirically testing this the, the 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 algorithm that is on the slide that requires invertibility. Yeah, yeah but I'm saying if you just have say like moment bounds. Yeah. yeah so like, like you might you you know sure. you won't get quite the same concentration, but. You'll still get that the data lies in the good set for sure. some definition. Yeah, of, sure, sure, sure. Some quantitatively different yeah. definition of that good. Yeah, that makes sense. That depends on the moment that you it, yeah. have on the bound. Yeah, like it, 
think if you have like a third moment bound, mm -hmm. then you, maybe you get, you know, D times some D. polynomial in N or something mm -hmm. like that. But mm -hmm. like even with known covariance, something similar comes up that like the rate changes, but sort of qualitatively the same idea of like, you know, truncate to a ball of some radius and add Gaussian noise works. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. Um, but this actually wraps up this approach. So if you have any other questions on this, we can talk about it now. Um, what I want to point out is that uh, this actually doesn't quite get us the sample complexity that we wanted, the sample complexity that we uh, have discussed so far, because the non-private term uh, has a slightly worse, depend worse dependence on the privacy parameter epsilon uh, and some log factors as well. Um, but th the thing I promised throughout the talk was is true, uh, but it just achieved by this other mechanism, which is the Tukey depth mechanism. Um, Okay, so I'll briefly talk about the Tukey depth mechanism and maybe we can um, wrap up. Yes, and we'll, then we'll wrap up and uh, do questions. Um, is it okay? Do we have another 10 more minutes? Thomas? Uh, only 15 more minutes until the hour. Oh, 15 is good. People will probably, people will probably yeah. leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, this, is, uh, this is good. Um, okay, so the approach that actually gets us the sample complexity that we want um, is different, but I um, wanted to point out that you know, this intuition should be uh, still there and you should keep it in mind that you want to add noise for privacy um, that scales with uh, the Covariance matrix of the the true covariance matrix of the scale. Um, so the first try of this approach would be to run the exponential mechanism um, with a score function that is the Tukey depth of a point with respect to the data set X. So the uh, higher the Tukey depth of a point uh, is with respect to the to, to the um, uh, data set X the higher the probability that I pick this point, that I sample this uh, point. So uh, let's not uh, dwell at the actual definition of the Tukey depth, but um, the Tukey depth intuitively uh, says that, um, let, let's look at the red point here. Uh, and intu intuitively, the Tukey depth says that if I pass a half space through that point, the point U, uh, and I wrote that half space. Uh, what's the minimum number of points of the data set X that are going to be left on one side of the half space? So here, if I rotate a half space, a half space around this red point, uh, what's the minimum fraction of points uh, of uh, the data set that are going to be left on one side? And that's actually 2 over 10. 2 out of the 10 points of the data sets are, are going to be always left at least to uh, on one side. Um, and essentially, the more central a point is to the data set, the higher the Tukey depth it has. Um, if a point is completely outside of the data set, then it has Tukey depth zero. If it's outside of the complex hull of the data set, it has Tukey depth zero. Because there is a half space uh, so that all of the data set is one, on one side and none of the points are on the other side. But if it's uh, in the center of the data set, then it could have potentially Tukey depth to one half. So the good thing about Tukey depth is that it has low sensitivity. If you change one point, the Tukey depth uh, changes by at most one over n. Um, and the other good thing about the Tukey depth is that um, essentially the points that have high Tukey depth are the points that have low Mahalanobis distance from the true mean with respect to the true covariance in expectation. Um, so 
what I'm trying to say here is that if you think about these uh, level sets uh, that have larger and larger picky depth, um, they have the shape of the covariance matrix. Um, and this is a, if you don't believe me, picture. Uh, Gavin made a tool that shows the covariance, ma covariance matrix and the actual two key level sets uh, in the data set. And uh, this is what it shows that um, the smaller tricky depth, the, the shape of the points that have a uh, certain tricky depth is the same as the points that have small, uh, like a certain Mahalanobis distance from the true mean. Um, and so this is the reason why this mechanism would be accurate. This is how we argue uh, about the accuracy of the mechanism. Um, but uh, again, the challenge, the first challenge to come uh, that uh, we have in this case is that we need to decide which is the space where we're going to sample the points uh, from. And there's actually a previous uh, work, like current work by Liu, Kong, Kakad, and Oh, that analyze exactly this mechanism. Um, and actually, they use it for not only private, but robust uh, mean estimation uh, as well. Um, and they assume that the mean lies in this box, uh, this d-dimensional box. And so um, you can search only in this space. Uh, but what we want to do is uh, to not have any dependence on prior information about the mean. So what we did instead is uh, that this, the space from which we uh, sample is a space of points that already have large tricky depth. And so we only sample the space of points that have tricky depth at least one fourth. Now, the difficulty with that is that this doesn't satisfy differential privacy because this is a data dependent um, set. And so for one data set, uh, there are points with which, uh, from which we will never sample, which we will never sample. They have probability zero of being sampled, um, and where, which might not be the case for the other data set. And um, so again, we need to do a pre-processing step in order to make sure that this data dependent sampling is going to be uh, to satisfy overall uh, differential privacy. And the preprocessing step in this case is um, a bit more um, perhaps unintuitive. Um, what we check is actually whether uh, by going through the last step, we're going to be differentially private or not. What we check is that our data are far from being unsafe. And data being safe means that no matter how many, uh, no matter how I point, uh, how it change one point in my data set for um, all neighboring data sets. Uh, the distributions over the last part, the step two of the algorithm are going to be epsilon delta close. And so safe data sets are the ones uh, for which no matter what their neighbors, uh, for every neighbor that they might have, the uh, last part is going to be epsilon delta differentially private. And so, if our data is far from being unsafe, then we run the step two. And if it's not, then we do nothing. And hopefully uh, this is, it's pretty clear that this should be epsilon delta differentially private, just from the um, definition of uh, what unsafe and unsafe and safe data set is. And we can prove this using say a proposed test release uh, approach. Um, but the thing that's more challenging in this case is that um, we need to make sure that Gaussian data sets pass, pass this step. Um, and we need to show that typical Gaussian data sets are also going to be safe. Okay, and so let's wrap up. Um, these are the two approaches that we have, the empirically rescaled Gaussian and the tricky depth mechanism. The tricky depth nails the sample complexity, which uh, is optimal even for the known covariance case. Uh, the empirically rescaled Gaussian has slightly worse uh, log factors and dependence on epsilon. Uh, 
Um, the empirically scale Gaussian works for sub Gaussian data provably. Um, the conditions for which the tricky depth works are, um, we think, should also work, are a bit more complicated. Um, but overall, um, it would be interesting to uh, try to relax the assumption of Gaussian data, like we uh, mentioned before. Um, but maybe one thing to mention is that if we go as far as heavy tail distributions, for example, we definitely have to lose ensemble complexity. Uh, by uh, comma single and Allman, we know that um, the ensemble complexity won't be, won't have this nice uh, um, guarantee. It can't be uh, D over alpha epsilon in the, non, the private term. Um, and the one, uh, thing that I have hidden so far, uh, but might have been uh, evident, is that these algorithms, bo both of these algorithms, are exponential time. Um, and for the tricky depth mechanism, there are more reasons. Actually, calculating the tricky depth of a point uh, with respect to the data set and also um, sampling from the exponential mechanism might also be, um, is also exponential, exponential time. But for both approaches, the pre-processing checks are exponential time. Um, and the one really super exciting and interesting question I think left uh, from this point on is can we find polynomial time algorithms that have the same sample complexity guarantee? Um, which also, by the way, for the non-covariance case, the algorithm is polynomial time. Um, if that says anything. Um, yes, that's what I wanted to share with you. And please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.